Welcome. Could you please tell me uh, who you are and why you're here? Hi. Yeah. Thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Amy Robinson, and I'm the creative director of iWire, which is a game to map the brain from MIT. And so I'm here at Games for Health EU to share how we're using games uh, and getting the general public, anyone, anywhere with no neuroscience background, uh, giving them the opportunity to help revolutionize how we understand the brain. Because the brain is sort of un, un uh, well uh, explored territory right right it's mostly uncharted territory and it's almost unfathomably complex i mean and there's 80 billion neurons and hundreds of trillions of synapses which are the connections among neurons uh and most of those networks are unknown um, but they won't remain unknown uh, because we're making amazing progress towards understanding how the brain is able to perform complex functions. Uh, everything from you know how you're able to see that something's moving in one direction, which is kind of a fundamental basic one, uh, and to other labs that are kind of looking at more complex cognitive functions. Yeah. So, why is it important? To, well, to know what's going on in there. Well, I mean, I think number one. Uh, I'm very curious about it. I feel like understanding how the brain works is one of the most fundamental questions to being a human being. Uh, it's extraordinary if you think about it that there's seven billion people on earth and we all have this little three pound organ and in that organ is everything that makes you who you are. And to me, I think we are now in this age of technology and software and ability to process big data uh, that we're making unprecedented discoveries about how that works. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's it's important because it's a it's a huge unknown and it's an unknown that's central to our understanding how the brain makes us who we are. Uh, I find that very invigorating and very fascinating. Yeah. So so you you build the game? Yes, we build a game. Uh, we, to do what exactly? Right, so the game is actually uh, to map neurons. So our lab is interested in what's called connectomics, which uh, looks at how neurons form networks in the brain. So we're looking at synaptic level resolution <coughs> connectivity. And now this is uh, nanoscale, tens of micron scale. It's very, very, very tiny. And sounds really complex. It's extremely complex, <laughs> right. And it's very uh, time consuming to reconstruct neurons. So actually up until a couple years ago, it took thousands of hours to reconstruct one neuron in full 3D. Uh, but we built software that brought the reconstruction time down to about 50 hours, which is a great improvement, but still 50 hours for cell times 80 billion neurons in one brain is, <laughs> is, is, is too slow, right? It's too slow, and I want to I answer to these questions in my lifetime. Uh, so we were, you know, in the process of kind of trying to understand how and trying to rethink the way that we approach neuroscience and the way that we reconstruct these networks. Uh, we kind of drew inspiration from games, from viral games online, like Angry Birds or Candy Crush. Uh, and so we turned our lab software into a game called iWire, and we launched in December of 2012 and now we have 85,000 people from 130 different countries who play iWire and are helping us understand how the brain's neurons form circuits to do information processing. So you, somehow you, you've, you've made this really complex thing you want to discover into a fun game. Yeah, yeah, so that was not easy. So, so you know, we're a computational neuroscience lab, and we're based at MIT's Department of Brain and Cognitive Sciences and MIT Media Lab. And so instead of just having computational neuroscientists at our lab, we actually bring in designers and game developers and uh, all sorts of people outside the normal realm of people you would encounter at a neuroscience lab to help us rethink the way that we're doing this. So we turned our lab software into uh, a kind of fun interface where you get points for kind of reconstructing neurons in a little cube interface and players are tasked with uh, finding missing branches of neurons so they are kind of given a volume of brain and as you scroll through uh, this volume of brain that has been imaged with an electron microscope um, they're able to fit together sort of missing little puzzle pieces and their their goal is to discover missing pieces of these branches of neurons and then we they do this sort of within a cube and then we fit thousands of those cubes together to reconstruct an entire cell. And then we reconstruct many cells and we fit those cells together to uh, create a network. And then that's how we, we pair that with sort of functional activity and then that's how we're able to understand how form and function results in 
higher level activity. Mm. So what has been the most difficult thing in, in, well, in getting to this game? Oh, that's a good question. There been, it's, it has not been easy. Um, you know, it's it's been challenging to build a system that's both fun and accurate um, because we are literally relying on gamers to conduct real neuroscience research. And so we had to ensure that the actions by the players of our game were accurate. You know, we can't submit papers if the, you know, we can't make discoveries if the actions are not accurate. So we've put a lot of effort into a back-end system that basically um, tries to uh, map as many neurons as we can while maintaining the highest level of accuracy uh, while reducing the amount of duplicate work needed. So we basically have multiple people map the same area of cells and if they agree with each other then we say this is probably correct. Uh, and there's certain players in the game who have leveled up to what we call minion mode. Uh, we have this player in the game called Grim Reaper that sort of slices off branches that are mistakes in the game. And the players are sort of self-regulating their own gameplay. Uh, so that has been very challenging uh, to actually implement and to figure out the right algorithms and the right system to put in place um, that makes it fun and challenging um, and accurate. Because the gamers probably don't know they're they're helping you, or do they? Oh, they do. They do. Yeah? It's, very, yeah, yeah. it's very clear, actually. And one of the things that we would like to do moving forward is sort of uh, make it so that you could play the game and you might not necessarily know that you're helping neuroscience. A game, to build a game that is just so fun by its own right yeah. that even if you don't care about making discoveries about the brain, which is unfathomable to me, but <laughs> even if you don't care, the game would still be fun. Uh, so right now you see sort of a real-time 3D model generated of the neuron that you're mapping uh, and we you know, make it very clear to players that what they're doing is actually helping a neuroscience lab. Um, yeah, so they know what they do. Um, it sounds like a really complex process. Does that mean there there was a lot of money involved? Um, you know, that's a good question. I don't know actually the precise amount of funding that we have received. Mm -hmm. um, but we have a team of six full-time people and 10 to 12 part-time people who work on iWire, plus uh, numerous in-kind uh, sort of sponsored people or volunteers studios, game design studios, uh, that work with us to actually create iWire. So it's, a, it's a, a large task for a small team with, I think, comparative you know, to a game like The Sims, right, that has $50 million. We're not even close in that ballpark. <laughs> um, but at the same time, it's not, you know, it's not cheap. To, no, to build no, to no. Free. But well, somehow it it all came together. Right, right. So yeah. I, you know, I'm in Sebastian Sung's lab, and he he took a real risk actually creating iWire because we didn't know if it would work. <laughs> um, and I've been at the lab now for a little over a year. And uh, when I joined, iWire had been sort of in development for several months, and there weren't many people playing, and uh, it wasn't really well known. There was a lot of duplicated effort in the game. Uh, and it was going very slow, and we really weren't sure how to turn it into something that was that was that was what we imagined it to be. Uh -huh. uh, and so it just involved bringing in lots of people from outside neuroscience and disrupting our entire thought process. Uh, but yeah, so. you are here at the conference as a, as a speaker too. Yes. Um, um, what's what's the point you want to to get across? Well, I mean, I'll be sharing iWire, which is which is one of the points. Uh, but I think really, what I am excited to share is kind of a perspective that we live in an extraordinary time. That if you are someone who has even a remote amount of interest in the brain, we're living in a time that's unprecedented in all of human history as far as making discoveries about about this amazing organ. Uh, we are going to be able to answer questions that people have wondered for hundreds, if not thousands of years. Uh, and those, some of those questions will be answered in our lifetime. Uh, and, but to answer them, we need people from outside neuroscience to take that jump into this discipline because no longer do you have to have a PhD in neuroscience to make a big difference because we need statisticians, mathematicians, we need hackers, we need game developers, we need designers, all these people to come in and just take our thought pattern and throw it against the wall and say rethink the way that you're approaching how we make discoveries about the brain. Uh, and it's very invigorating to me 
to be kind of alive where we are because we're also seeing sort of species level investment and call to action from the European Brain Project, the America's Brain Initiative. It's uh, an international call for neuroscientists uh, and non-neuroscientists and the world to kind of, you know, push boundaries uh, in our understanding farther than it has ever been. Mm -hmm. And I think that's damn exciting. So that's kind of why I'm here and what I hope I get across <laughs> in my to talk. To get a, a great enthusiasm yeah, across. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> so how long will it take now with the, with the game and all the people who are playing uh, to, well, to, to completely map it? Well, it's a good question and we don't know. No. Because that ability to completely map a brain is contingent upon new software. Uh, which is one thing that's really better, holding... Better, faster. Right, right. Better, faster software. Because a lot of the technologies that neuroscience labs are using, and, and not just neuroscience labs, but all sorts of biological labs and just labs in general, uh, are relatively new. And so they generate huge amounts of data that take very long periods of time to analyze. So, for example, you know, we are mapping a data set um, from the retina that has been around since 2006, and no one's ever been able to map it in full. Uh, and there's other labs that will spend a couple weeks generating data and years analyzing it. And this is regular. This is a regular occurrence. Uh, and a lot of these tasks uh, could be somewhat automated. Uh, and I think that's that software and that computational science, computer science, um, and the development of algorithms and artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. These are going to be the things that really exponentially increase our, our rate of making discoveries about the brain. And I don't know how to predict how those will unfold because, you know, you could have a great leap forward that that changes everything. And it could happen in a year, two years, five years, 50 years. And there will probably be many of these uh, types of discoveries. But, you know, I hope that we're able to map a brain in my lifetime. And yeah, we yeah. will if I have anything yeah. to <laughs> so, say so about it. So then you can, can you, you can win the Nobel Prize for, for mapping the brain. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, it, and this idea of mapping the brain is something that, you know, we hear a lot about in the news now. And, and there is not just a way to map the brain. So when we talk about mapping the brain, uh, first of all, there's six orders of magnitude of complexity in the brain. So you've got a whole brain that's right here, uh, but in order to see individual synapses, you have to zoom in 100,000 times, right? They're very, very, very tiny. Um, and then once you are able to reconstruct at synaptic level resolution, you have to look at, you know, starting with two cells, tens of cells, hundreds of cells, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions, tens of millions, and there's many levels of circuitry of complexity in the brain. And then within those circuitry, you have uh, a dynamic network. So synapses are growing <laughs> and receding in periods of minutes. And then you have to look at also time signatures. So the different networks are firing at different rates of time. And then they have different genomic expression. So you have to look at the, the overall network complexity. You have to look at functional activity. And then you have to be able to see the dynamic network. And that's what neuroscientists talk about when they say mapping the brain. It's it's not a static map, but it's not a map like any map we've ever seen in history. No, no. But it's going to be amazing once we do it. And we will. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Good luck. You're welcome. <laughs>